Hello. Right. My name's Matt. I'm going to really quickly start this talk with a quick sort of disclaimer. I'll give you 10 seconds to leave the room if you don't want to be here. This is not a talk involving in-depth, detailed exploit techniques. This is not that sort of talk. If you want to leave, I will close my eyes, turn around. I'll give you 10 seconds, disappear now. I lied, I'm giving you two. Hello, my name's Matt. I'm a developer at a cybersecurity company. We build tools and platforms to train new generations of cybersecurity professionals. I'm a mentor and a mentee. I like learning from and teaching those around me. It helps me be better, it helps them be better, it helps everyone in the long run. I'm a tinkerer, be that code, new classes in Dungeons and Dragons, ways to monitor my lizard, that sort of thing. I just like playing around with things. So we'll get started with kind of the first question of this talk. Who are hackers? They range in age, background, experience, skill sets. Um, there's no real kind of stereotypical hacker. I'm not a hacker, you can tell, because I don't have a hoodie on right now. That's not, I failed at the first hurdle. But there's a few different definitions. Now, these definitions are very brief in this next slide. They are not there to be the be all and end all. They're just there as a kind of overall, here's the sort of people we might be dealing with. These things are talks in and of themselves. We have black hat hackers. They are hackers doing evil. White hat, hacker doing good. Gray hat, hacker hacking. Top hat, hacker doing fancy stuff. Fog hat, hacker doing fun funky stuff. Um, that's actually a slide that was a tweet that I saw literally a few days ago, before, like the day before I went to a conference, and I had to put it in because it made me chuckle on a plane. Um, ultimately, there's lots of nuance, lots of, lots of crossover between these various different kind of types. It's a very simplified version, but that's, like I said, a whole separate talk in and of itself. Ultimately, if you get tempted to poke around in a system and see what's happening, please make sure you have written permission to do so before you start doing it, because bad things can happen. The best way I heard it described recently at a security talk, someone said, how do you not get arrested for doing these things? And the person giving the talk said, well, thankfully, I work with journalists, and they work for news companies who have lawyers. So they said, I can kind of do whatever the lawyer tells me to and hope that, you know, in, in the long run, I'm paying them for a reason. So, um, yeah, don't do that sort of thing. So, there's three kind of main traits that I'm going to focus on with some of these things. Hackers are clever, creative, and curious. Now, curious is the big one that comes back over and over and over again in everything that happens and everything that goes on. They're curious with that sort of sense of, what if I change this value? What happens when I do this? And then using that with sort of creative, out-of-the-box thinking and trying to break things and do things in ways that you will never, ever imagine they could. They can come up with some very clever solutions in order to bypass whatever it is in your system you're putting in place. So why do they do it? There's a whole bunch of reasons. Again, I'm just distilling it down into a few here. They might do it for financial gain. They might put some sort of bit locker on your system in order to, you know, um, get you to pay them some Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in order to unlock and get your files back. They might do it for reputation. There was a big thing a little while back with security company or security organizations on Twitter doing it for the lols. There's corporate reasons, and that's not even necessarily one company breaching or trying to attack another company. Corporate reasons are a company hires a pen testing and security company to go, hey, come and see how we're doing. Ideological reasons being political, social, religious reasons as to why they might want to do it. Westboro Baptist Church was hacked by Anonymous live in an interview because the Westboro Baptist Church was about to protest the funeral of the children from a school shooting. Anonymous disagreed with it and hacked, on, and hacked and defaced their website whilst they were on the air. And it could also be that you've just stumbled upon something. There's no real reason why someone can't just accidentally stumble on something because there's a, a gap in your system. So then that's kind of why they do it. And we need to look at what makes you specifically a target. What about your company and your organization, you individually, makes you a target for someone like this? Although they've also not got a hood, so they might not be a legitimate hacker. If you're popular, I'm sorry, you're a target. If you post any kind of politics and your perspective online, you're a target. Again, the ideological reasons and hacktivism is quite a big thing and it's growing. It could be the people. People in your company, it could be ex-employees that are disgruntled and don't like you and the way you got rid of them. It could also be people that have opened up vulnerabilities in your systems without even realizing they've done it with no malicious intent. In 2014, there was a company who 
performed a security check on their VPN network because they noticed an awful lot of traffic come from China. This was a US-based company. They sort of looked into it and wondered why they'd done it, and it turns out that one of their employees was outsourcing their work to a very cheap software development company over there and had given them corporate VPN access in order to do it for him whilst he sat on eBay and Reddit. He also shipped his physical security key to them so they could get the auth tokens in order to get onto the network. That's not even someone doing it with the purpose of bringing down a company. That's just, depending on your perspective, creative or lazy. And it could just be potluck. Automated scanners, tools. Someone's just browsing the web and happens to notice something on your site. That's a possibility as well. Ultimately, because this is not going to be an in-depth talk about any sort of exploits, it's not about the exact mechanisms by which they use that timing channel side attack in order to get into a system. It's about the quick wins. Well, how can they get the most damage, the most value, in the least amount of time and effort? Because much like developers, some people are really lazy. <clears throat> we just happen to make it a lot easier for them by the things that we do or the things that we don't do. So, what can we start doing to reduce the risk of attack, of data breaches, anything, anything like that. Notice that the word is reduce. There is no what can you do to be secure, because that doesn't exist. There is no magic solution. We're not fighting vampires with stakes. There's no be all and end all to them. This is about what are the things that we can start doing and the little things we can put in place in order to start reducing that risk. Security is not a destination, it's a journey, it's an attitude, it's a way of thinking. It's a mindset and it's something that you need to put in through the entire project. You need to make sure that this isn't just considered as an afterthought. This isn't just at the end of the project. You go, right, now I'm going to secure my system. Because what were you doing six months ago? How do you remember why that piece of code was so weird and you put that little to-do comment above, to-do, fix, because it's strong, uh, because it's strange. And then you look back and you go, I can't see why it's strange. It was, that was past me. So these are the sorts of things that you need to put in to your spec when you're discussing these things. You need to make sure they're considered in implementation periods. You need to make sure they're done as part of your CI pipeline when you're running tests. There are a number of automated security checkers out there to help with this. They don't do everything, but they do a good job. You also need to make it a part of your acceptance criteria when you're actually coming up with the end result of this. Anyone who knows me loves my, knows that I love my testing side of things, so the fact that I can get do, write better tests into a security talk is a win for me. But if in your acceptance criteria you put things like, as a user, I should not be able to access the accounts of another user, it's a very simple step to start putting these sorts of things into play where you can actually run this as part of an automated test suite. The problem with it all is that ultimately the reason we have to do it through the entire project is that no one has the time or money until it's too late. No one has time or money for security until you get breached and then suddenly management will write you a blank check and tell you to go away and fix it. At that point, you're in damage control. There's no fixing it. There's just reducing the damage that's been done. And then you get the marketing spins that come out afterwards where they say it was a really sophisticated attack by a very, very clever malicious, um, malicious actor that breached your system. It turns out you're Equifax and you just used admin, admin as your username, a password combination. And the reason that this isn't all the complicated stuff is examples like that where these are huge companies, and they still get the basics wrong. I asked a few people more experienced than me, people I respect and I admire, what are the things that they would like to tell developers with regards to this topic? And the same things came up. The basics. That's what people get wrong, and that's what lets people in. The basics means that, yeah, you can't do anything until it's too late. There is no way to hack time and go back, fix your problems, that doesn't exist. It's once the data's out there, damage done, damage control, hope your reputation doesn't get damaged to the point where you go out of business. And because you need to do it through the whole project, it's every developer's responsibility. There is no dedicated right. You're our security person, so you go and do it. Some people might be more experienced with others, but that's where things like pair programming, peer review, code review, that sort of thing comes into play. Much like if one person is more experienced with testing or databases. It's not necessarily their job all the time, but others around them can learn through osmosis and make sure that they get involved in the things that are being done. Which kind of leads us into, well, now we've gone from it's not always the technical stuff, it's people. And there is the big thing, which is the people problem. Now, 
again, I've kind of mentioned it's, it's not like the movies. Um, in reality, everyone would like to think it's like this, where we need to build a million dollar cluster to crack this encryption, and in reality, I'm gonna drug the person and hit them with a hammer until they tell me the password. Your people are a weakness. It's always the problem in systems. Unfortunate, but it's true. So with this, consider something like the principle of least privilege. Now this is not, don't give people the job, the tools they need to do their job. This is give them the least amount of tools to do their job as is required. Who here could open up their laptop right now and log into production without really any issues? Honestly? Okay. <clears throat> do you need to be able to do that on a snap of a finger? Maybe. For most developers, that might not be the case. I don't have production access. I don't have database access. I will do if I really need it to do my job. But the idea being that with the principle of least privilege, you can limit who has access to what. Your, de your developers, all of them, don't need 24-7 access to your production database with read and write privileges. It's just not required. If you think so, I'd like to talk to you afterwards as to why they need that, data, that access, because there's probably other ways to do it better, but you don't need this sort of thing. Because reality is that no developer should really have a permanent login or access to any credentials. Notice permanent login, permanent access credentials. This doesn't mean they shouldn't have access to them, but they should not be permanent. Great quote from my friend David. That's not to say that a break glass button in an admin interface can't generate a production database login. It's valid for an hour. It needs to log who requested it, why they requested it, and it needs to be auditable by everyone. Notify people that this has happened. This sort of thing is possible. And with tools and a lot of infrastructure that's out there, it's a lot easier to do these days. So this is gonna get into the aspect of, well, where is this data stored? So where is your data stored? It could be on your web server. You might be just writing files to the web server. It could be in connected data stores, be they caches, databases, file systems like Amazon S3. It could also be your repositories. That's data. It's your infrastructure as code. It's your code itself in the project. And I had someone come to me and say, well, yeah, that's fine, but you know, I secure my systems. And I'm like, that's really good. I'm really happy that you secure systems. That's, what it should be. that's the way it should be done. But the reality is that so many people don't. You go online and it's very easy to find records that were just left in exposed databases that just sit there without any authentication on them, spewing data out for anyone who's willing to look. And it goes back to, again, this is not advanced hacking techniques. This is not you know, covert infiltration of an organization. This is a go on Google. So then you're considering no one in this day and age runs their own infrastructure. So it's kind of about who are the third parties you trust with your data? Do you send messages around on Slack? Does that contain any data in it that could be used? Who you, you know, do you use Jira? Do you post information on Twitter about what your project is doing and how you're working on it? So that's your data, but then we get into the side of things with your customer data, and that's where you know, things like GDPR come in, where it says, hey, you shouldn't be doing things that you don't need to be doing, and everyone hides behind the idea that, well, I can post it as a legitimate business use case and do whatever I want with the data because it's legitimate use, be that use exploit people. Google did get fined by this. Um, they were deemed not to have the a justifiable and viable use case for data that they were using for advertising purposes. So that was when it comes to, well, actually, do they even need that data? So when data is such a big risk for us, why do you need it? If you don't need it, don't have it, because then you can't lose it. But the sorts of tools that are available and out there are not massively complicated. There's a tool known as Shodan. Who has been on or searched through Shodan before? It's quite a fun little tool. Basically allows you, much like a lot of search engines, to search for things online. Specifically, you can go into Shodan, type in MongoDB, and it will tell you all the MongoDB servers it can find on the internet. So be surprised how many aren't secured. It searches IoT devices for exposed things. It will search web servers, webcams, the lot. So when there are tools that are out there and not even necessarily hidden tools, this is just available and whatever to use, you then kind of think, well, actually, my data stores that are connected, what sort of risk is there? Which then means that, yeah, if you don't have it, you can't lose it. So with tools like this, making that sort of data easily accessible if you've got it wrong, don't have it. 
And if you do have to have it, you do need to keep that data, please make sure you encrypt it, both in transit and at rest. There is no excuse not to use HTTPS and SSL and TLS these days. Let's Encrypt made it really easy to get this sort of thing up and running. Um, at once, from scratch, created, deployed, and secured an application in a language I've never used before in about 10 minutes after someone said, but it's really hard. Um, it can be difficult, but hiding behind the excuse of it's hard doesn't hold up when things go wrong. If it was easy, we wouldn't be doing this job. Or we want to make it easier, shall I say. But. So we've got these kind of external connected data stores, and we have things like our repositories that hold data. Repositories alone aren't necessarily all that's needed to run an application. You've got a lot of secrets. You might be talking to Stripe with an API key to take payments. You probably have secrets in there for your database in order to know how to talk to and authenticate to it. You need to also check your repos for these secrets because these sorts of things are public. There was a really big thing a while back where GitHub actually just straight turned up their search facility on the website when someone discovered that you could search for the uh, leading characters of an RSA private key and see all the repositories that had them in the, in the source. They then turned it back on a little bit later without any fix, so we kind of wondered why they had turned it off. Was it just sheer panic? Probably. But again, this is people that have actually just committed these things and put them in the repository. But there are tools to help with this. This isn't a, you know, a hopeless, oh, but what if I get it wrong? There are tools to help with this. No matter what you do, there are tools to help you stop doing this. This is GitLeaks, which is a project that allows you to run it against a repository. It will tell you what things it finds. It will search back through the history of the project to see if it finds any commits that contain that sort of data. Because why should you might just be looking at the repository as it is right now going, it's fine, there's nothing in there. History might stay otherwise. My favorite example was someone who posted um, a project that they'd built on a website and they posted it on Reddit. And someone posted a comment saying, that's really cool. You might want to go and change your secrets and your FTP username and password because they're in the repository. Um, and they did this by changing the website homepage to say, you need to do this and change your secrets. The person fixed the website, made it look right again, posted back on Reddit with a comment saying, thanks for that, I've gone through and done that. Um, thanks for the heads up, that's really nice of you to do that. And, you actually, and they were actually quite you know, receptive to this sort of feedback. About five minutes later, the website was updated to say, no, you haven't. <laughs> because they'd added a commit to remove it in the latest version, they hadn't changed the secrets and they just left them in the history. So this sort of thing can help you track down those, those things that you get, oh, it went in, damn, I need to get it back, I need to get it out. Which then leads us into the public side of things, because public sites can have secrets on without you realizing either. And this is quite a fun one. There's a specific type of query, it's called Google Dorking. It's basically, I mean, we come up with the better names for things. Um, it's basically a way of using the advanced search parameters of Google queries to find things in websites. So if you go online and you type something like this, DB password file type env, you will find all the public websites that have a .env file committed with a DB password in it. Surprising number on Google if you do that. There's a whole bunch more, but I won't go through them. But that's the sort of thing that if you have committed secrets into your repository, there's the chance that you're actually pushing them out to your public website in the wrong way as well. Which kind of leads us into this. There's a new and emerging kind of style of intelligence gathering called OSINT. Basically, it just stands for open source intelligence. And this isn't poking things that aren't public. This is looking at things that are explicitly public and are out there and freely given information in order to build up a profile on someone. There's a website, the OSINT framework, and it's really cool just how many ways there are to find information about someone. You can click through, and if you want a username, you click the username section. It will go, okay, what sort of things do you want? This one. And then it will tell you, here's all the websites you can go to to see if a username exists within a given service. And before you know it, you've built up an entire profile of someone without really knowing much about them. And this kind of feeds that level of, what if? I'm curious about this person, this organization. What can I find about, out about them? It's not even necessarily that they're trying to hide it. They could be posting freely public things. Again, going back to the kind of, it's not like the hacking movies. In the hacking movies, they're going, you know, clone the badge and insert a new picture in and whatnot. It can happen, because people do start a new job at a company and then post on Instagram, start my new job. Here's my ID badge with the barcode and the picture and my name and the company and the color of the lanyard. 
But that what if, what if I did this? Where could I get with that? That's kind of the thing that underpins everything. We then get into the user side of things. So this is focusing on us as developers, what can we do? No system works without users. Now we've all heard before, you know, don't trust user input. Users will not necessarily try and break things. They might just try and register a username with an emoji and then suddenly your system doesn't work. They might try going into your shopping cart and changing the quantity to minus one and see if you'll pay them instead. These are the sorts of things that you shouldn't be trusting. You should be doing these kinds of logic and validation texts, but these are the sorts of things that a malicious attacker is looking at your site saying, okay, well, what, what about these inputs? These are just vulnerabilities and ways into your application. What can I do with them? And it's not even, like I say, necessarily malicious things going on with this. I received an email from a recruiter last year from a recruiter I'd used in the past. Perfectly good relationship with them. They were lovely people. I just wasn't looking at the time. So I looked and there was no unsubscribe link on their email, which was naughty. But I sent them a message on their website using their contact form. And I said, I'd like to be removed from the mailing list, please. Fairly simple and uh, innocent message. At which point the website threw up a massive dump of SQL and the stack trace of the problem that had happened because the query was invalid. No points for guessing why it was invalid. This is not advanced. This is the basic stuff. We hear it time in, time out. Use prepared statements, do these things. The fact that this was like 18 months ago and it was still happening just kind of leads you to believe that this people just aren't getting it. And yeah, it's 2019 and injection is still number one in the OWASP top 10. There's a reason for that and it's because people aren't getting the basics. This is not quite an OWASP top 10 talk in disguise. It very nearly turned into that. Because it's possibly one of the best resources we have to go and fix the top 10 things that are broken on websites. Because again, it's down to that, what is the most damage, the most value I can get out of the least amount of effort? So we're not trusting user input or user data, which then leads you into the next level of extreme is, well, don't even trust data. Because whilst you might not believe it's come from a user, probably has at one point, there was a website, it was a Whois lookup website. You could go in, type a domain name in, and get a Whois lookup of all the DNS records for a domain name. Fairly straightforward. They were just pulling down the records of what was registered with the domain name and displaying them on a website. And one person put a, uh, the embed code for Risk Astley is never going to give you up in a TXT record on their domain. And the website you were doing the lookups on popped up the video and started playing it for you. Because they weren't, they just trusted the data. But you know, at what point did you kind of sit down and consider, oh, maybe DNS records are a way, an attack vector for a system. That's a really good way to get in. This is not even just about trusting user data. Ultimately, yes, that data was provided by a user at the very end of it. But this is just, you're talking to APIs. There's very few systems out there that don't talk to some sort of third-party API in this day and age. If you're just trusting the data that they sent you, what's to say that they haven't been compromised and they're not sending you malicious things? Which leads us into the next one, which is a one that you kind of see more than you might think. And again, it might sound obvious to some, but please don't just validate on the client side. Don't just assume that because it's coming from a mobile app, you don't need to do any validation on the back end because there's no other way to get to your application. It's from a mobile app. People can't expect to inspect element on iOS and go through and change that in their app, but they can install a proxy and look at the uh, network traffic as it goes through. And they can sit there and you think, well, actually, if it's client-side validation, then the back end's just letting it through. There's nothing stopping them doing it. It's just the client side going, oh, please don't do this. And the back end going, whatever, I'm just a sign, not a cop. If you're validating client side, you're doing your validation here and you're sending data to the back end. But it's very easy. This isn't necessarily inspecting someone else's traffic. This is just about inspecting your own traffic. In a few clicks, you can set up a proxy that allows you to observe the network traffic going through it. So you can see the content going through on that connection and see the payload. And if you can do that, then you can just send your own payloads to the back end and see if they get processed as well. Surprisingly, it happens quite a lot. It happens a lot in computer games. There were a number of games that would do all the calculations for whether or not an item dropped after you killed a boss, for example, on the front end. And a surprising number of people worked this out and just sent requests to the back end to get all the loot that they wanted. Because the back end's going, well, I'm just assuming it's coming from my client because, well, it's got to have, right? 
it, you don't trust that data. Which then leads us into, we're not trusting users, we're not trusting data, we're not trusting users with things such as broken access control. Again, another thing that's in the OWASP top 10. Now, there are ways to get around this. It used to be called kind of insect, insecure direct object references. It's been merged with a couple of other bits and pieces, but it's now referred to as broken access control. And it's, for example, just because you know the number of an order does not mean that you should be able to access that order. Lots of people still use auto-incrementing IDs in their database, so if you have an order like this, do you trust that number? What happens when inevitably someone changes it to one, two, three, four, five, seven? Should they be able to see that order for one, two, three, four, five, seven? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the user. I'm not going to go into the specifics of um, role-based access control or attribute-based access control. Um, my lovely boss has given a talk on that before, and we ended up coming with a solution that's way more complicated than any of, any of us have worked on before, but it's a whole topic in and of itself. But these are the sorts of things you should be checking. Just because you know the idea of that, don't just go and fetch it from the database and show it to them. What if that was an order and you're displaying addresses, emails, mobile numbers? Well, now you've just allowed anyone to get any details on there. And again, this sort of thing happens all the time. So we're now we're not even trusting input necessarily, we're just not trusting users themselves which might sound a little bit paranoid prepper, lock yourself in a room, don't trust anyone, and wait for the apocalypse to come. But not trusting your users is kind of a fundamental way to treat a lot of things. We were at a company meetup, and we were doing an escape room. And our team had, half of them were sort of part of the security team, and half of us were just developers. We got into one of the rooms, and it said, right, now you need to crack this four-digit code in order to get out of the room. And half of us worked out the first two numbers, which was really cool. So we then said, right, well, we'll try and work out the rest of it, whilst one of our security team just started working his way through incrementing the numbers. Got to about 15 and the door unlocked. At which point the, uh, <laughs> the person running the event was like, that was really quick, you guys are amazing. I know, right, we're just that good. They hadn't figured out that if you can get the first part really easy, the rest of it's got a maximum of 100 attempts. So we worked out he could try like, what, two attempts a second, I think, on the keypad, if he was really quick. So like, you know, in a few seconds, we were out the door. The next one's kind of, again, in the OWASP top 10, but it's one of the big ones that's becoming more and more problematic, but has been based on things that have existed on the internet for a long time. Broken authentication, kind of one of the earliest instances of broken authentication I experienced was when I built a nice little website. You could log in, it was great. It sets a little cookie in your browser to say what user you are. And then one of my friends realized that he could change it to user ID equals one and log in as the admin. Because I hadn't checked that sort of thing. This was back when sessions weren't as common as they are now. But again, broken authentication is still a thing in this day and age. So to say something like hash passwords properly is not the end of the story. It's a thing you should be doing but it's not necessarily what an attacker is doing, because they're not looking at, well, if I can break your database, I can get and get your password hashes. Cool, but if I'm using bcrypt or argon, you're gonna be there for hundreds of years trying to break them, until quantum computing comes a thing and everything falls apart, but that's a bigger problem for the internet. But it goes down to things like, don't use default passwords again. Equifax were reportedly using admin admin as the password, and that's what caused the big uh, data breach that they had a couple of years back. And the really bad part is you don't reuse passwords. There was a really interesting study run by LastPass last year, along with LogMeIn and Lab42. And they surveyed 2,000 people, which isn't a huge sample size, but it's enough to start drawing some numbers. And they found that 60% of those 2,000 people were reusing passwords. And of those, over 60% were reusing passwords for both their personal and their work accounts. 80% of them had up to 20 accounts online. So suddenly, that's actually quite a wide range of websites that potentially have the same password for users that will get you into not only their personal Facebook, but their work email, for example. So it's not even about your site getting breached. It's, you might be doing the best things you can. You're storing passwords using bcrypt with high costs so they can't be cracked. But if myawesomedogs.com has, has been hashing them with MD5 with no salt for the last 10 years, because that's what it used to be, 
and a user's got an account on your site, there's probably a high chance they're reusing the password because the users are lazy like that. People might have heard of the website haveabeenpwned.com. If you haven't, go to this website, type in your email address, hit enter, and it will tell you all the data breaches that are on the site that your email address has been found in. I mean, quite a lot which sucks, but there's nothing I can do about that. Websites on the internet get breached. The good thing is I've got unique passwords on my accounts, so it's not as bad of a problem as it could be. So we need to start looking at not allowing our users to reuse passwords either, because credential stuffing, which is what the attack is known as, I'm gonna go and find a breach where your password was listed on that. I'm just gonna start trying it on all the other sites that I know you're on. I'm just gonna stuff your credentials into as many websites as I can, see what I can get access to. There are ways to stop this sort of thing. Passwords are not unique for a lot of people. So you end up with things like this. Anyone know what that is a hash of? Or what hashing algorithm was used? We can search for it in Google. It's not as fast, you know, I mean, people think, oh, well, I'll go use Hashcat or John the Ripper to go and start cracking my way through passwords. Just Google it. Because a lot of people are just using password. And it's, you know, there's a lot of results for that that come up on Google. It's not a difficult thing. So this is not advanced stuff to go and start cracking passwords with you know, lines and lines of text scrolling past your face like in the movies. So we don't want to allow users to use these sorts of passwords. There's an API for that. It's the Pwned Passwords API provided as part of Have I Been Pwned. You can send the first five characters, I think it is, of the hash of a password off to the site. It will return a list of all the passwords that matched that first part of the hash along with the number of times those passwords have been seen in breaches. If you see that password on that list, don't let the user use it because that password they're using is vulnerable because it's out there on the internet somewhere because it got leaked on some website. There are many packages in many languages to just automatically integrate with this, much like an SDK. You don't have to worry about calling the API yourself necessarily. And then you can do things like, well, if you start using multi-factor authentication, that means that if they do get their password leaked, it's not necessarily as bad because people can't necessarily get straight into their account because you're using an additional factor. A username and a password is a single factor of authentication. They are both just things that you know. Who here has never used two-factor authentication before? Awesome. I asked that the other day and someone, like a bunch of people put their hands up and I'm like, have you used chip and pin? Because that's something you know, which is your pin number, and something you have, which is your card. Without even realizing it, you're using multi-factor authentication. There's a third factor, which is not starting to come in, which is something you are. So behavioral stuff, biometrics, fingerprints, um, eye scanning, that kind of thing, facial recognition. So you can do these sorts of things where you start asking for an additional code to log someone into their account. A lot of people are using SMS for this, but please don't. It's very easy to convince a phone company to change this, the phone number on a SIM over because you've got access to someone's account and said, oh, I changed my, my credit card recently. If I give you the last four numbers, can you just verify that that's me? And people are very trusting because customer support people are taught to help people as much as possible, not consider the security implications of what they're doing. Again, social engineering side of things, the people are the problem. So now we're getting into what can we do in terms of code to start putting these sorts of things in place. Who here builds applications with no external dependencies on projects? It's not the world we live in. It used to be, you just write it all yourself. Now it's just really easy to such and such install this package and you've got a database layer you can use. So which packages do you trust in your application? GitHub done a really cool thing recently where they start checking these packages automatically for security vulnerabilities that they might find. Which is quite cool because when you consider that actually you require this package and that requires another one, and another one, and before you know it, your web of trust is really quite vast. You probably have more packages than you think, because you might think, well, I've got this, okay, that's fine. I'm primarily a PHP developer, so I'm sort of thinking through my PHP packages that we've got. But then I realized, actually, there's a front end to this website that has packages. There might be mobile apps that have packages. Now there's the back end. Then there's the platform and the operating system that I'm running on, as well as the infrastructure, because you, know, you might be using something like Terraform to provision your infrastructure in code. And suddenly you realize this web of trust is a lot bigger than you might think. If there's one thing that you do with any of this, it's just keep them up to date. Old software is forgotten about, it's lost to the ashes of time, and it never gets those security updates. 
don't rely on the users of those packages, so the developers of those packages, to necessarily update them. People like to think that they're entitled to something in open source software, that if you know, they're using this package, they're entitled to this, that, and the other. They don't owe you anything. Open source developers are doing it because they can, because they've given up their free time to do it a lot of the time. They don't owe you jack. So with all of this, it's, there's a really nice phrase, I say nice phrase, death by a thousand paper cuts. Not a nice phrase. It illustrates the point quite nicely. It's a term that was used because it was a way to kill someone. The idea being that it's not a beheading, it's not one enormous and your database is exposed in one fell swoop. It's the result of what are all these little things that go wrong in your system? All these little problems that, prop up, that crop up, lots of small bad things that ultimately result in the demise of a person, in this case, a system. It's not that someone is looking through your system thinking, ah, oh, I'm just gonna find that exposed database. That might not be the case. But all of the little mistakes add up because they use that to build a profile on what your application is doing. What's it running on? What sort of hardware are you on? Are you running outdated versions of software? What sort of APIs and third parties are you talking to? Ah, oh, you're taking payments. I can see you're using Stripe. Let's have a look and see if I can find out those, that Stripe information that might be on there. Lots and lots of these small openings add up. Again, you're in the middle and you don't realize that all of these packages, all of these platforms, all of these tools that you're using, every technique that you use, every place you put your code, all the people in your organization, they're all ways into the data that you've got or the systems that you're running. Mistakes will happen. There's no, like I said, there's no absolute security. It's not one thing fixes everything. Mistakes will happen. But attackers aren't necessarily looking for the really small thing in a niche website. Just get the simple stuff right. That's the first thing to start with. Because that's what, get, that's what gets hackers in and attackers into your system. It's not them sitting down with a million dollar supercomputer trying to crack the encryption on traffic between two points. That happens, but it's not gonna happen to most of you, I'd imagine. So I'm really sorry, it's not like the movies. I'm not gonna stand here on stage with my hood up, lines of code flashing over my face, algorithms floating around me in the air as I kick back on a chair drinking wine and looking at my gooey interface for my uh, worm that I'm compiling. I'm not gonna run up to someone and start double typing on a keyboard or the famous quote from a TV show, I'll just go write a, a, a GUI in Visual Basic to track the IP. That's the sort of, that sort of thing is fantasy. The expectation is something really quite fun. The reality is a whole lot more boring. It's trawling through endless posts of the latest vulnerability. I literally saw one as I was sat this morning doing something where PHP has a vulnerability that allows people to remote code execute on their website and it's something that comes through Nginx and it was like, oh, that was like two days ago, great. It's another thing you have to factor in. It never ends and it never stops and it's just endless scrolling through your emails of what are the security advisories that I'm being sent. In reality, I'd love to be able to sit there frantically typing on a keyboard with four hands. I'd be some sort of bioengineered weirdo, it'd be great. Things you need to do. You need to evaluate who you trust with your data, both the people and the systems, because ultimately behind the systems, there are the people. Make sure you're doing and putting in security at all stages of the project. Consider it at spec level. Don't just accept that what someone's saying is gospel. Try and push what they expect the system to do if things go wrong. Make sure people don't have 24 access, 24 seven access to the things that they don't need. The principle of least privilege is really quite a good one for that. Make sure you encrypt your data in transit at rest. There's just really no excuse at least to do it in transit these days. Checking for public secrets is something that's a lot better now with things like Google Dorking to check if that's on your site or checking your repositories, for example. Don't trust input, but also don't trust your users. They might not even be trying to do something wrong, but they will. Make sure you hash your passwords properly. That's the start for your passwords, but then go on to do things like don't allow people to reuse passwords. Don't allow them to use default passwords. Make sure your components aren't vulnerable. Keep them up to date. Use the various security checkers that may be available to you. 
we're quite lucky in PHP land, we've got some very, very good security checking tools that will check our project dependencies for us. And the OWASP top 10, like I said, this nearly turned into an OWASP top 10 talk in disguise. Um, but it's a really good resource and it really is a frustrating thing to see the new report come out every what, four years or whatever it is and the things haven't changed. They might have been renamed slightly or they might have merged two things together or you know, slightly expanded some stuff, but fundamentally it doesn't change. Cross-site scripting is still on there. Sensitive data exposure is still on there. Injection is still the very top result. That stuff doesn't change. And the fact that it's 2019 and that's the case proves that these, just things, these things aren't being done. But if there's one thing that is kind of the crux and the foundation of all of this sort of stuff, it's just to always be curious. Don't just take something at face value. Take that kind of playful nature that a lot of developers do have, and I hope that we all have, because it kind of, you kind of look at something and you go, yeah, but what if I did this? It's that nature to use something in the way that it shouldn't be done, that kids do, quite frankly, that allows you to have that additional mindset of how you might get into a system and therefore how you might better protect it. Thank you very much. <laughs>